Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Jackie Van Ham, your girl in the know for all things motorcycle. How's it going out there, everybody? Welcome back. Welcome back to another week of awesome shows out here. Um, if you're a regular viewer, you know that on Fridays, I like to open up the camera and do a little bit of a fun fact Friday, talking about all sorts of things, actually. We talk about the history of motorcycles. We talk about some motorcycle engine basics. We kind of cover a lot of different things here on Friday afternoons. And today's show is one of those historical shows because this past, not week, but past two weeks, um, a very, very special company named Mot. Taguzzi celebrated its 100 year anniversary. So I'm in, in honor of this beautiful brand, I wanted to go ahead and do a show entirely dedicated to La Doccia Vita and the folks at Moto Guzzi. Are you, are there any Moto Guzzi fans watching? Let me know in the comments if you love this awesome brand. If you ride a Moto Guzzi, let me know what kind of Moto Guzzi you ride. Um, feel free to peek in, say, hey, let me know where you're tuning in from. I'm always curious. I always stream these shows over also to YouTube. So to our U YouTube watchers, go ahead, smash that subscribe button, hit that like button. And here on the Facebooks, go ahead, hit that share button on the lower left-hand side of your screen right now to let friends of yours know. And we are jumping jumping right into the pool, the, the sweet, delicious Lake Como pool of Moto Guzzi, which is based, of course, in Mandela de Lario, which is on the, on the banks um, of the beautiful Lake Como waters. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started. So it's not Lake Como, Mandela de Lario is, is in a different region. But anyway, it's, it's next door. It's in the same area. <laughs> Before you eat me alive in the comments, um, let me know what is going on with you out there. Now let's get down to it. So as I said, um, today's show is going to be dedicated to the 100 year happy birthday for the friends over at Moto Guzzi. Moto Guzzi is an Italian motorcycle manufacturer and the oldest European manufacturer in continuous motorcycle production. Established in 1921 in Mandela Delario, Italy, the company is noted for its historic role in Italy's motorcycling manufacture, its prominence worldwide in motorcycle racing and industry innovations, including the first motorcycle center stand, wind tunnel, and eight-cylinder engine. Um, so the company's engine motorcycles are noted for their air-cooled 90-degree V-twin engines with a longitudinal crankshaft orientation where the engine's transverse, transverse cylinder heads project prominently on either side of the motorcycle. But that is not the engine the engine design that they've been using for forever. That didn't really start until a little bit later in the program. Now it's absolutely a very iconic Moto Guzzi thing. You can spot it from a mile away. If you see it, there's a very, very 99.9% .9 chance that it is a Moto Guzzi. Um, but they got started and their bikes looked very different. Obviously, that's no big shocker. Everybody's Everybody bikes looked different 100 years ago. But let's go ahead and take a gander at the very first motorcycle designed by Moto Guzzi, the origins of Moto Guzzi. Moto Guzzi was conceived by two aircraft pilots and their mechanic serving in the, in the um, Corpo Aeronato Militare, the Italian Air, Corp, uh, Air Corps during World War I. Carlo Guzzi, Giovanni Rivelli, and Giorgio Parodi, assigned to the same squadron based outside Venice. The three became close despite coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds. The trio envisioned creating a motorcycle company after the war. Guzzi would engineer the motorbikes. Parodi, the son of wealthy Genovese ship owners, would finance the venture. And Ravelli, already a famous pilot and motorcycle racer, would promote the bikes with his racing prowess. Guzzi and Parodi, along with Parodi's brother, formed Moto Guzzi in 1921. Ravelli, ironically, had died just days after the war's end in an aircraft crash and is commemorated by the eagle's wings that form that Moto Guzzi logo. Carlo Guzzi and Giorgio Parodi, along with Giorgio's brother Angelo, created a privately held silent partnership with the Societa Anomina Moto Guzzi on the 15th of March 1921 for the purpose of the manufacture and the sale of motorcycles and any other activity in relation to or connected to metallurgical and mechanical industry. The company was legally based in Genoa, Italy, with its headquarters in Mandelo. The very earliest motorcycles bore the name GP. 
for Guzzi Parodi, although the mark, the mark quickly changed to Moto Guzzi. As the only actual shareholders, the Parodis wanted to shield their shipping fortunes by avoiding confusion of name GP with Giorgio Parodi's initials. Carlo Guzzi initially received royalties for each motorcycle produced, holding no ownership in the company that bore his name. In 1946, Moto Guzzi formally incorporated as Moto Guzzi S.P.A. with Giorgio Parodi as chairman. Carlo Guzzi's first engine design was a horizontal, single-cylinder engine that dominated the first 45 years of the company's history in various configurations. Through 1934, each engine bore the signature of the mechanic who built it. As originally envisioned, the company used racing to promote the brand. In the 1935 Isle of Man TT, Moto Guzzi factory rider Stanley Woods performed an impressive double victory with vin wins in the lightweight TT as well as the senior TT. So this first bike on your screen is indeed from 1921. That is their very first motorcycle they ever made. You can see that lay down horizontal engine. This is a single cylinder engine. Now you're going to see a couple of years later a little bit more development and that iconic flywheel on the left hand side of the machine, which is how this bike has earned the name of the pepperoni slicer, the pepperoni racer, um, the bologna slicer. I've heard this called a million different names because of that flywheel on that side, that circular shape over there, that flywheel looks like, like a, butcher's, a butcher's blade, right? So that's, that's kind of the nickname for these bikes. But this is a little bit further development. You're starting to see um, some really iconic designs here. Obviously, with the number plate on it, you know, this bike probably has some racing pedigree going on as well. But just gorgeous, beautifully designed machines. I love the look of these bikes, you know, from, from beginning to current. I think that they've always just had a very, very cool look. But particularly these early bikes just are so dead sexy to me. You know, I, I just love the way that these bikes look, which is why I really also wanted to do today's show. Um, until the mid-1940s, the traditional horizontal four-stroke single-cylinder 500cc engines were fitted with one overhead and one side valve, but contrary to the usual practice of having inlet over exhaust, this employed the side, val side valve for induction and the overhead valve for exhaust. In the 1950s, Moto Guzzi, along with the Italian factories of Gilera and Mondial, led the world of Grand Prix motorcycle racing. With durable and lightweight 250cc and 350cc bikes, Designed by Giulio Cacano, the firm dominated the middleweight classes. The factory won five consecutive 350cc world championships between 1953 and 1957. And realizing that low weight alone might not continue to win races for the company, Carcano designed this iconic V8 motorcycle, which is going to be this guy right here. The V8 500cc GP race bike, whose engine was to become one of the most complex engines of its time. Despite the bikes having led many races and frequently posted the fastest lap time, it often failed to complete races because of mechanical problems. Ultimately, the V8 was not developed further as Moto Guzzi withdrew from racing after the 1957 season, citing escalating costs and diminishing motorcycle sales. So the bike on your screen right now is that V8 that I just mentioned, which is the very first motorcycle V8 ever produced. Now let's see her naked. Let's get those clothes off. So take a look at this huge, massive V8 engine shoehorned into that motorcycle frame. I mean, this basically, for all intents and purposes, is a car engine wedged into a motorcycle frame. This put Moto Guzzi on the map. Unfortunately, like I just mentioned, they had a lot of mechanical issues. So this bike didn't perform quite as well as they had hoped but it still is super fascinating, super interesting, and puts Moto Guzzi in a very special place in the history of motorcycles. Um, and then if we go back, again, looking at some of these machines from Moto Guzzi, you're going to see a little bit more development. You know, we went from this guy, which obviously started to have some more design to it. It started to look much more like a motorcycle than a lot of earlier companies that looked like bicycles with engines put into them. These clearly have very motorcycle specific design going on. You can see that already, you know, and these are very early machines. These look like bikes. These, these look like they could almost be produced modern day which is really neat. I love to see that. I love to see that that development and that focus entirely on making motor bikes, not bicycles with engines put in them. So I wanted to show off a couple of these earlier designs. Again, these are still in the singles range. 
These are still going to be that horizontal. You can see that engine jutting out from the front as single cylinder machines. Let's see here. And then again, that beautiful, beautiful V8. The period after World War II was as difficult in Mandelo del Lario as it was elsewhere in post-war Europe. The solution was production of inexpensive, lighter cycles. The 1946 Moto Ligera and the scooter, scooter known as the Galetto sold super well. So the Moto Ligera 65cc, as you can see, this is just an itty bitty little guy. Uh, Post-World War II, you're going to see a ton of this type of machine and scooters really boom after World War II because um, the economy was in shambles all across Europe. Nobody had money. The roads were bombed terrifically. So nobody could, A, number one, afford a car. B, number two, the roads were so terrible, a car really wouldn't work very well. You know, not only could people not buy them, but they weren't as particularly useful as traveling on two wheels. So you're going to see a lot of machines like this. This is a super duper, like, smack on it looks dead on for the ducati the very first machine put out by ducati which was known as the cucciolo which is the name little puppy uh it was a very bicycly looking bike uh, with an engine shoehorned in it this is a very very same kind of style you know even though they had made these huge leaps and bounds progress with their motorcycles because of world war ii because of its location because of being involved in world war ii all the bombing all the motorcycles being damaged they kind of had to go back to a little bit simpler design and a little bit simpler thought process. So this is a very, very common uh, common play for a lot of companies based in Europe post-World War II. And then this leads to a different type of evolution, which is the evolution of the scooter. So you're going to see the scooter boom happening in the 1950s because, again, the economy was still starting to come back, but it wasn't quite enough for people to afford cars. But they needed bikes and little scooters with fairings on them and covered wheels so that way they could drive them every day to work or to, to social activity or to the grocery or around town and not get their clothes dirty and not and not get messed up. You're also going to start seeing motorcycle companies pulling the exact same type moves. You're going to see companies, um, you know, like Triumph start doing the bathtub fairing. You're going to see bikes um, all throughout Europe start to have these very fared type looks. You know, Ariel did some fared bikes. I think Norton did some fared bikes. Um, lots of European motorcycle manufacturers started doing this because this is what was selling. This absolutely dug Moto Guzzi, you know, and put it, dug it out of the red and started putting it into the black. This was a top seller for Moto Guzzi at this time. Though modest cycles for the company, the lighter cycles continued to feature Moto Guzzi's innovation and commitment to quality. The step through Galetto, which is on your screen, initially featured a manual four-shifted three-speed configuration, then later a four-speed setup by the end of 1952. The displacement was also increased. Um, Moto Guzzi was limited in its endeavors to penetrate the important sco scooter market as motorcycle popularity waned after World War II. Italian scooter competitors would not tolerate an incursion from Moto Guzzi. By innovating the first large wheeled scooter, Guzzi competed less directly with manufacturers of small wheeled scooters such as Piaggio, also known as Vespa, and Lambretta. To illustrate the delicate balance within the Italian post-war motorcycle and scooter markets, when Guzzi developed their own prototype for a small-wheeled small -wheeled scooter, Lambretta retaliated with a prototype for a small V-twin motorcycle, threatening to, to directly compete on Moto Guzzi's turf. The two companies compromised. The Guzzi never pr produced their small-wheeled scooter, and Lambretta never pr manufactured the motorcycle. So super interesting. By 1964, the company was, however, was in a full financial crisis. Emmanuel Parodi and his son Giorgio had died. Carlo Guzzi had retired to private life and direction passed to Enrico Parodi, Giorgio's brother. Carlo Guzzi died on the 3rd of November, 1964 and Mandela Delario after a brief hospital stay in Davos. So then we start seeing a little bit of changing, a little bit of a rocky road for the folks at Moto Guzzi. Again, 
you know, just it was very, very difficult. And a lot of companies foundered and went under during this time because there was this transition. You know, they kind of made great steps with this little, little, the, with this little guy, this little Legera, which led to this guy, the Galetto. And then, then, then by this point, though, this is the mid 1950s, economy started coming back. Roads were fine. People started having money. Car sales started to happen. Car sales, as, as people had more money and were purchasing cars, motorcycle sales got squashed. So you're going to see a really, really rough time for a lot of motorcycle companies in this kind of like 19, late 50s, early 60s. You're going to start see, seeing some really, really rocky roads until much more development happened because what they needed to do to compete with the car people was build bigger and more powerful motorcycles. And this is how a lot of companies saved themselves and dug themselves out of kind of a black hole during this time frame. This is the beginning of the super bike era. This is when Honda developed its CB750. This is when um, Ducati started making much larger, larger bikes. This is when Triumph was making larger bikes. This, I mean, this is when everybody had to step up their game and start either putting out 750s or, or they were going to be in trouble because they had to compete. You know, that does not include dirt bikes because dirt bikes, dirt bikes started booming in the late sixties, early seventies. I'm not including that in this category, but I'm just talking for general everyday purpose motorcycles. They all started going head to head with displacement. There was no replacement for displacement. And, uh, this company, Moto Guzzi was, uh, had the same school of thought. In February 1967, a state-controlled receiver took ownership of Moto Guzzi. The SEIMM oversight saw Moto Guzzi adapting to a culture shift away from motorcycles to automobiles. And I, I promise, I didn't read this first. Um, uh, the company focused on popular lightweight mopeds and then at 125 Stornello. Also during the SEIMM years, Guzzi developed the 90-degree V-twin engine designed by Giulio Cesare Cacana, which would become iconic of Moto Guzzi. And there we go. This is one of the earliest Moto Guzzi's with this V launch with this reverse V twin. Again, this is a 90 degree V twin engine designed by Giulio Cesare Carcano. This is a 1969 V7 750 Speciale. The Moto Guzzi had employed engines of myriad configurations. None has come to symbolize the company more than the air cooled 90 degree V twin with a longitudinal crankshaft orientation and the engine's transverse transverse cylinder heads projecting prominently on either side of the bikes. The original V-Twin was designed in the early 1960s by engineer Giulio Cesare Cacano, designer of the double overhead cam V8 Grand Prix racer. The air-cooled longitudinal crankshaft transverse cylinder pushrod V-Twin began life with a 700 displacement and 45 horsepower designed to win a competition sponsored by the Italian government for a new police bike. The sturdy shaft drive air-cooled V-Twin 1, giving Moto Guzzi renewed competitiveness. The 1967 Moto Guzzi V7, with the original Carcano engine, has been continuously developed all the way up until the 1200cc versions offered today. Tanti redesigned the motor for the 1971 Moto Guzzi V7 Sport, another iconic bike for Moto Guzzi. Now we're going to start getting into even more iconic Super sexy 1970s super bike era. I did a show several weeks ago about some of the beautiful bikes from Ducati. Um, I definitely talked a lot of smack about the bikes that were designed in like the 80s and maybe the early 90s because they just weren't my favorite. I can't help it. I am super partial to 1970s Italian motorbike design. They just are peak, peak Italian sexy bike to me. I just can't help myself. I love these machines. Um, but this is just iconic as can be. Again, these uh, V7 Sports, the green tank. This is just super, super dead on. This just is Moto Guzzi, like prime, prime Moto Guzzi. Um, anyway, uh, where am I going? The engine is the basis of the currently used 750cc, 1100cc, and 1200cc engines. Um, the Di Tommaso years, 1973 to 2000, after experiencing financial difficulties in the late 60s, Di Tommaso Industries Group, or manufacturer of the Di Tommaso Sports and Luxury Cars, owned by Argentinian industrials Alejandro Di Tommaso, Tom, Tommaso sorry, purchased SEIMM along with Benelli and Maserati in 1973. Under Tommaso's stewardship, Moto Guzzi returned to profitability. Although other reports suggest a period of limited investment in Moto Guzzi, 
followed attributed to DTI using Motoguzzi financially prioritizing their automotive ventures. In November 1975, Motoguzzi first showed the 850 Le Mans, Another bike that was kind of during these years, also another iconic Moto Guzzi is the Eldorado. This version is the 850. I believe this is from 1973. Um, police bikes were based off of this bike. You'll see a lot of early 1970s police bikes utilizing this platform. Just because again, of like the reliability of these engines, this is a, a V-twin. It's just, it's just a 90 degree V-twin, that's all. And crankshaft driven machines means way less maintenance. So you're gonna see these used in police forces all over the place. You can still find these for sale, dressed as, um, as police bikes. Another machine coming out during this 1970s era is the Moto Guzzi Le Mans 850. This is another, I keep saying it, but just peak, peak Moto Guzzi, peak 850. Um, I absolutely love this bike. This has always been on my top 10 list of dead sexy bikes. I love, it's hard to tell on the screen, on this screen, but you can see that there's actually a color shift on that front fairing. They go from that traditional Italian red to a little bit more of like a tomato-y, like orangey type red. I just love the two-tone of this. I love this turbo, turbo cafe racer vibe going on with this bike. This bike came also in even rarer blue with orange, with the, which this with a bullet goes to the top of my list of favorite motorcycles. I love this blue and orange combo together. This is just so like weird and different and totally 1970s and disco. I love this bike. Again, this is that beautiful 850. Um, and even rarer was this version in white. This bike also came in white, but you never, ever, ever see it. You see it dressed as this most of the time. This second of the time, white, rare as hen's teeth. Um, this also led to, so this is going to be getting into 1970s. In 1979, a small block version of the air-cooled V-twin designed by engineer Lino Tanti was introduced as the V-35. So this, this is the V-35 Imola. So this is even smaller and more lightweight version of those bigger, beefier 850s. This is not... I don't want to say it's super rare. They are a little bit more difficult to find. Uh, there also was a Monza during this year, which is, was, was again a little bit smaller, a little bit more lightweight. I think that they are just very, very cool because they're just kind of little miniature versions of these 850s. <laughs> I think that they're super cool, but this made a big deal because Radical when introduced, the design featured horizontally split crankcases and here on heads. The former was a common feature of contemporary Japanese motorcycle design, whilst the latter was widely used in car engines. Both features allow more efficient mass production and also the design of the engine and associated components cut the weight from 548 pounds of the contemporary 850 to 835 pounds. So it shaved off just a ton of weight. The power of the original V35 was only a whopping 35 horsepower, but was competitive because it was much, much lighter. As Guzzi continued to develop the V-Twin, power was increased in the mid-1980s when Guzzi created four valve versions of the small block series. Of these, the 650 and the 750 were rated now at 60 horsepower and 65 horsepower, respectively. The production of the four valve small block engines eroded in the later 1980s. So... Let's take a look at some of these bikes now from the 80s. I'm going to blaze through these a little bit. You know, I love featuring these brands. I love doing these anniversary shows, but I'm going to miss some stuff. I can't cover 100 years in 20 minutes. So I'm going to skip over a couple of years, and I'm just going to show you what I consider some really, you know, cool and different and maybe weird uh, bits about Moto Guzzi that you might not be familiar with. This includes this Moto Guzzi. Um, this is going to be... Uh, 1980s era in 1985 this is at the top of the screen 1985 Moto Guzzi this is the V75 I just love that totally 80s as can be I mean look at the look at the the shape of this bike this just screams 1980s to me I love it it's super weird it's an odd duck I love odd ducks so I wanted to go ahead and show that bike 
This also is the beginnings of them branching out into several other styles of bikes. They're going to sprint. They're going to start branching out into a little bit of like a sport tour or tour type bike flat out with the hard cases and the windshields. This is going head to head. This now is a 1000 CC bike. This is trying to go head to head, of course, with by other bikes of this era. By this time, you know, BMW was playing in this game, was in this same sort of sport tour tour era. This is also the era of the Cal. California. This is the era of their first attempt of getting into this kind of cruisery type market. And this California has stuck around, actually. Um, this gets a, a maligned, not necessarily this version, because this still is pretty tidy, but it goes straight on into cruiser land a couple of years down the road, similar to the Ducati Indiana. It gets much maligned. It is does not do well, particularly in this country. However, they are super inexpensive and easy to find and fun to cut up and make into custom bikes. So this is also, so this is going to be the Moto Guzzi. Oh, sorry. One of my little dogs over here is just having a heyday. Uh, Moto Guzzi California. This also is getting, again, some new some new and different avenues for Moto Guzzi to be playing in. You know, we're, the, we're getting away from those classic type designs because we're progressing forward, right? We're heading into the 80s and 90s. So this is going to be the RS. This is the Daytona. This is a flat out sport bike from Moto Guzzi. It is dead sexy. Oh, look at that. Look at that sexy Italian beauty bike right there. They're also going to start getting into straight up dirt bikes. So this I thought was really interesting, you know, with all this talk recently of, you know, Harley Davidson getting into Pan America, BMW always being in the GS lane. Moto Guzzi also was jumping into this lane. They were doing this 650. So again, this is going to be that smaller crankcase, that more lightweight engine that puts out, you know, not a ton of power, but it is more lightweight. So it kind of offsets itself. This is the NTX from Moto Guzzi. I think this is just super, super cool as can be. Again, we're talking a little bit. I'm speeding through some 80s and 90s years. This is going to be a little bit more naked sport bike from Moto Guzzi. Um, so from 2000 to 2004, this was the Aprilia years. They were owned. They were purchased again uh, by another company. They were purchased by Aprilia. And then 2004 onwards, they become a member of the Piaggio team. So now let's start taking a look at some Piaggio genre bikes. This is going to be one of their throwback. This is the V7, but this is an 850cc. Oh my goodness. Are you okay over here? Sorry, one of my dogs is chewing on a little toy over here and it's just been corking up, corking himself up. I think he swallowed something down the wrong way. Um, so this is going to be the V7, the 850 during the Piaggio years. This is obviously a retro styled bike. This is heading into the now time. This is much more current. They still have this bike, this V7 available. There's also going to be, they jump back because they never really left. They were kind of doing some versions, the Norge and a couple of other sports, or I'm um, sorry, adventure-y, adventure tour type bikes. This is the V8TT. This is current day also. This is just a handful of years old. But again, the hard boxes, the windshield, the big, the big fender, the lifted fender up front, the crash plate underneath. This is very, very adventure bike. Definitely just guns blazing into the BMW GS category. Another different area that they stepped back into or wanted to get into several years ago is going to be the bagger category. That's right. Did you know Moto Guzzi got into baggers? Several years ago, they jumped into the bagger category with this just murdered out beautiful bagger with the red cylinder heads. This was known as the Flying Fortress, which is the baddest name I've ever heard of for a motorcycle ever. I love this bike. I don't know how it did sales wise. I think this only lasted for a handful of years, but I remember when this came out, I thought that this was just the cat's meow. I still do. I think it is just a super, super cool version of a bagger from our friends over in Italy. Now let's talk about modern day. They've got a couple of anniversary bikes because this is again the 100 year anniversary from our friends over at Moto Guzzi. So this is the Moto Guzzi Bobber and this is going to be their anniversary trim. So again, they are throwing it all the way back to 100 years when their first original colors were kind of, you know, silver and and green. Those were their first colors before it went red, 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 any color you want so long as it's red. Um, this was going to be a little bit of a throwback uh, bike for them. This is also their entry into another 
very American category, which is the bobber. And this is going to be their 100 year anniversary colors. And I'm going to end today's dedication, La Dolce Vita of Moto Guzzi, with the V8, the V85 TT. This is again that beautiful adventure bike from them. And this is in their anniversary colors, that beautiful silvery, silvery gray and green. And I think that bike is just Super, super bellissima. What do you guys think about that out there? What did you think about your 100 years of Moto Guzzi with your girl in the know, Jackie Van Ham? Your fun fact Friday. Now look, I got to tell you, it was my pleasure to put this show together because I am a genuinely a huge Moto Guzzi fan. If I have any overseas watchers, I hope you have on your bucket list to go to the factory in Mandelo Delario. It is open every single day during the week, I believe, from like noon to five. It's got limited window of opportunity, but you could still go take the tour. I've had the good fortune of doing so. I was overseas with my bike in 2018. I, of course, made a beeline for the beautiful Lake Como area. And I knew, you know, if I was going to go spend a couple of days, um, eating delicious gelato and uh, laying out aside Lake Como, I knew I had to put this on my list and you better believe I did. So I've had the good chance of going and doing the museum tour. It is incredibly special. It is incredibly cool. I love the bikes. I love the brand. The history of this incredible brand is super deep and fascinating. I know today's quick 20 minute show just kind of glossed over some of the highlights, but I hope that you enjoyed it. This is one of my favorite companies making some of my favorite bikes. And maybe I hope I turned you on to something new out here. What do you think about today's show? Go ahead and let me know in the comments. Take a minute and please share and, and like, of course, this video with your friends and uh, you know, the more eyeballs we get out here, the more I get to keep doing what I do. So it's really important that we share all of these videos with all of our motorcycle pages and our friends and our groups and all that kind of good stuff. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Each and every one of you watching these shows, clicking, liking, and sharing lets me do what I do every single day. So thank you so much. I also have really good news. I'm going to be in northern Indiana next weekend. Uh, that is the Easter holiday weekend. I'm going to be emceeing a race event up there. Indoor, dirt motorcycle and quad racing. I know that's right. Quads and bikes. It's going to be a hoot. It's two days of racing Friday and Saturday up in ship, ship, Shawana, ship, Shawana, Indiana. Um, I'll throw the link in the comments or you can watch Wednesday's show for more information on that, but they just hired me yesterday to go up and announce it. So I will be there. It is open to spectators. So if you are in the tri-state quad state area, come and say hello to us. We would love to see you. So thanks so much everybody for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks again to my show partner, Vroom, retract that groomyourroom.com. Go ahead, grab yourself a light fixture. I build kick ass lights for motorcycle parts, of course, for your home, your garage, or your desk at KentuckyBuilt.com. Huge thanks to Chopper Town, my host for all of these awesome shows for the past five years. Thank you so much, Chopper Town. Thank you to my event partner for the last month, BMW Motor Rad. Thank you to my product provider for the past for, um, that hooked me up with an awesome helmet in Daytona torque helmets. If you're shopping, go check out the awesome helmets for sale at torque helmets. My event partner coming up, Texas motor speedway, May 21st, 22nd, 23rd. See y'all down in Texas. Have a great weekend, everybody. And I will see you next week.